Right, so this video is going to look at separating mixtures. Um, it's going to look at three methods, three uh, types of uh, mixture separation in particular, filtration, crystallization, and distillation. Now there is a fourth, chromatography is also a mixture uh, separation technique. However, there's a little bit more detail to it, uh, and it does cross over with paper two in terms of AQA anyway, so that's going to have its own separate video. Um, now, a good starting place for the separation of mixtures, uh, a video on this, is what is a mixture? Now, a mixture, uh, in terms of a definition, quite simple definition, is two or more different, there's some key words in here that I'll underline in a second, different things, and the word thing really, it, I'm leaving it quite vague, um, and these things, these two or more different things, are not chemically joined. So we could use a particle diagram to uh, to highlight this this uh, this idea. So there's one particle. Here's a different particle, which I'm putting some lines through. There's that first particle again. Here's that second one again. I'll introduce a third one. Why not? There are some spots key thing here is I've got in this case three different things and they are different which is which is good I know they're different because in this case I've shaded them differently but they are not chemically conjoined there is no bond between them and therefore because they tick these two uh, criteria I can say that this here is a mixture a more obvious example that you may have seen in real life is salt and pepper in a bowl that would be a mixture two separate things not chemically joined rice and peas a uh, mixture not um, chemically joined. Now in an ideal world um, when we're separating mixtures we would separate them say just really easy. We would pick the bits out, rice and peas. We could pick the peas away from the rice nice and easy. However in terms of chemistry sometimes these mixtures are such that we can't do that. We need atomically small hands or tweezers to do that which we haven't got and we can't do and it would take us millions of years perhaps because there's so many little particles to separate. So we can use these techniques to help us and to separate a variety of different things. Now I'll try and give an example as I go through of each thing that could be separated using um, from these methods. Um, but let's start the first one, we'll look at filtration. So the separation technique of filtration requires very very simple equipment. It requires two things, a funnel and it requires some filter paper. Now this is of course a diagram and so filter paper doesn't normally look like this, it's not got these weird little holes in there but in reality what we don't see when we look at filter paper is it does have very very small holes in it and that's absolutely key to the process of filtration and that's why it works. So filtration is the perfect technique to use if we have some sort of solution or a liquid and it has in it an insoluble solid. And what I mean by that is a solid that has not dissolved. And a good example of a liquid with an insoluble solid in it would be something like um, sand and water. So if we had sand and water in a beaker together, that would be an example of a mixture, one of which contains a liquid and an insoluble solid. And I can use filtration to separate those. So what I would do is I would take my sand and water mixture and I would pour it into here, into the top of my open funnel and filter paper. What would happen is it would collect in here and gently over time what I would see is my water would start to drip through here and I would end up with water collecting in my beaker or my conical flask or whatever it is that I've put underneath this. My sand on the other hand would collect inside my filter paper and the reason for that is really quite simple. The sand is too big to fit through the filter paper whereas the water, the tiny little pieces of water, they are small enough in that they can fit through the filter paper. If we were to zoom in on filter paper, you'd see it looks something like this. So here we can see all those paper sort of fibres and between it lots and lots of gaps. The water is small to fit through these gaps, the sand is too big and cannot fit through these gaps. So the key thing here is we have an insoluble solid and we separate it using filtration. 
one thing it's worth noting is in an exam they may specify a, a situation where you have an insoluble solid in some sort of liquid and they want you to produce or to write a method which produces a pure dry sample of it. So what it's worth doing is once we've got our filter paper here it's worthwhile giving this a rinse, giving my solid a rinse with some cold water and it's worthwhile then taking this and leaving it to dry on a windowsill for example to allow for the water to evaporate. What you should have in the end is a nice cleanly washed nice and pure and dry sample of this insoluble solid. The next separation technique is crystallization. Now crystallization works when instead of having an insoluble solid in a liquid we have a soluble solid in a liquid and a good example here would be something like salt water. Now salt water is just a solution of water with salt dissolved in it. Now we couldn't use filtration to separate salt water because whilst the water particles are really really small the salt whilst when it's a solid is quite large when it is dissolved those salt particles uh, the salt lumps they break down into very 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 tiny little pieces so if we place that into some filter paper the entire thing would go straight through which would be completely rubbish so we can use a process such as crystallization to separate this substance if we wanted to get the salt for example and crystallization is quite simple we take an evaporating basin and we put into it our solution and in my case this is the salt water that I've put in here now what I do is I heat this using a Bunsen or some sort of heat source it doesn't really matter what it is but I'm going to heat this likely using a Bunsen nice hot flame on there and I'm going to keep heating and keep heating and what will happen is in the, within the solution the water present will start to evaporate now this won't happen instantly, it will take a good while to do so, but if you fast forward a number of hours, days, weeks, whatever, you'll find that the water that makes up the solution here, as it evaporates, it leaves behind the solid. Now initially we would heat this with a Bunsen and we would do so until solid starts to appear. This is called the point of crystallization. And it's at this point we would remove our evaporating basin from the heat and we would place it on a windowsill, for example, and we'd leave it for a few days. What we would see is after a few days have passed, the same evaporating basin would have in the bottom crystals. And if they we're sticking with my salt water example, we would now have in the bottom here salt crystals. Water has evaporated initially because of the heat and then just generally over time. Now this needn't be salt water, it could be copper sulfate solution, it could be potassium chloride solution, it doesn't matter. The key thing is the question will indicate that you are trying to, trying to obtain solid crystals of this soluble uh, substance, in this case salt, and here it is in my evaporating basin. Now the last technique uh, in terms of separation is distillation. Now distillation is a little bit more complex than the equipment is much more expensive if you're using the proper stuff um, and requires a bit more setup but it looks generally speaking something like this now there are a number of key points to this and distillation is used in some very specific circumstances so to run through the equipment first of all we've got a Bunsen down here which is providing heat which is heating this thing here in this case salt water which I'll come back to in a second heating this container here this um, round bottom flask We've then got a thermometer here, bung in the top. We've then got an opening into this thing here called a Liebig condenser where we've got cold water coming in the bottom, coming out then at the top. So this is essentially a cooling jacket. It's quite clever because the water never comes in contact with this bit down the centre, um, but it acts as this cooling jacket just to make sure that the vapour that passes down here uh, gets nice and cold. And then finally, we've got a little piece of glassware there and into, in this case, a nice conical flask. So what happens is this, if we use this salt water example, we heat up the salt water, the solution in here, what we find is over time, once this gets hot enough, the water within the solution will start to boil and the water will evaporate and it will turn into vapour. And this steam, this vapour you can see here, and that will move up here. Our thermometer will start to get higher and at this point, once the vapour is coming off, it will start to read around about 100 degrees because that's the temperature the water evaporates at. So our vapour's coming up here, it has nowhere to go, it can't go through here, so it goes down this tube and it comes into the condenser. And this cold water around the outside cools the vapour down, and the vapour therefore turns back into liquid. 
and it then rolls down here and drips into my container. Now if I did this for long enough you would end up with just salt in there and you would end up with pure water in here. Now this particular method here is a method of um, separation of salt water called desalination and some countries, although it's a very expensive method because of the heat involved, some countries can, and I think they might do this out in the Middle East, possibly I might have made that up as well, um, it can be used essentially to produce drinking water from seawater or ocean water which you can't drink as is because of the salt content. So by heating up the um, salt water you can evaporate the water but you then collect it so it's very similar to the crystallization process but rather than the water evaporating and just going into the atmosphere we then condense it back down collect it and then we can drink it so that's one use of this another perhaps more obvious one and an easier one that you'd probably see in the classroom is a mixture of two liquids so imagine we've got a mixture of ethanol and water so ethanol and water is a mixture of two liquids. It appears just as a colourless solution. You wouldn't know there's two, in, two things in there. But we've got the ethanol and we've got water mixed together. Now we can't separate that using filtration because it would pass through. We can't separate using crystallisation because there are no solids dissolved. Both would just evaporate. But we can use distillation to separate them. And the reason we can use distillation to separate them is because they have different boiling points. Ethanol boils at 78 degrees Celsius water boils at 100. So in my flask here, instead of having salt water, if I had the exact same setup but I had ethanol mixed with water and I heated this up and I heated until my thermometer here was reading around about 80, 85 degrees, something like that, what I would find is that as this is heating it would appear to bubble and what would happen is the ethanol would be boiling because it has reached its boiling point and it would be turning into vapour and that vapour would be coming down here, it would be condensing here and it would be moving down and collecting in my flask. My water on the other hand, because the temperature has not reached its boiling point, it would remain as a liquid in the bottom. Now if I did this for long enough, eventually I would drive, I would evaporate all of the ethanol off and I would end up with ethanol in this flask here and I would end up with pure water in here. So I would then would have separated ethanol and water, two liquids from one another. And this is the exact same concept that's used in fractional distillation which will be covered in another video as part of the crude oil topic. So there you have it. Three separation techniques, filtration, crystallization and distillation, all three of them separating different things all three being used in very particular circumstances, but all three of them relatively simple to understand once you get behind the basics of what's occurring.